Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Encompass Live. My name is Michael Sowers. I'm the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission in Lincoln, Nebraska. Happy Boxing Day to everyone, and uh, we have a small group with us today, but we are recording, and we'll make this recording available to anyone who wishes to watch. Uh, Encompass Live is a weekly online show sponsored by the Library Commission in which we talk about pretty much anything related to libraries and librarians, and this week is my monthly tech talk that I'm doing today, and it's, uh, as I said, uh, the day after Christmas, so uh, not, not a lot of people in the office. In fact, we have some uh, whole sections of the building at the moment where the lights aren't even on. So um, Krista is out of the office. She's uh, back east visiting her family, and so I'm taking this show solo, and so that's going to make a... a things a little interesting, especially for me. So uh, as we get started here, before we get into Windows 8, our topic, um, just want to kind of give a few caveats uh, to explain how it's going to work a little bit this time. Um, first off, uh, I'm here to kind of give you an overview and show you what's going on with Windows 8. Um, I'm not here to make a case for Windows 8. Uh, I mean, I have my own opinions, but I'm not trying to convince everyone to move to it tomorrow. Um, second of all, I'm mostly talking about Windows 8 from a user's perspective um, and a lot less from an administration perspective. There's all sorts of issues around Windows 8 if you're going to be administering a network or maybe offering this to the public, things like that. If you have questions about that, I can try to address them uh, towards the end if you like, but um, I'm mostly going to be showing this from a user's perspective. Um, also, uh, when it comes to q and I, I really want to try to answer your questions as, as much as possible, but the way GoToWebinar currently works with Windows 8, I can only see the GoToWebinar interface when I'm activating the desktop, and, and I'll explain how the desktop works uh, here in a few minutes. So um, I not only do I not have somebody sitting next to me watching for your questions on another computer, I cannot always see the GoToWebinar interface as I'm going through here. So I will... Uh, at uh, as many points as I can, try to take a look, see if any questions have been submitted. Uh, you're happy to raise your hand and uh, submit them via audio, but it may work a little better this time around if you submit them in the Q&A panel uh, so I can read them back and find them that way. So with that, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to double check to make sure you're all seeing my title slide there. That's very good. And I'm going to go ahead and get started here with Windows 8 by going to the Windows 8 start screen. Now, I don't know who in the audience has, has seen this or not, but this is now the start menu. There, there is no uh, orb down in the bottom left-hand corner that you used to see. This is the screen that you get uh, after you log into your account. We'll talk about user accounts in, in a little bit uh, later in this presentation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this is your start menu, now known as the start screen. Uh, one thing I do want to say about Windows 8 is everything you want to do in Windows 8 can be done either via the, via the mouse, uh, via a touch screen, should you have a touch screen device, which I don't have uh, on this laptop, and via the keyboard. So in this case, what I did was I just pressed the Windows key, which in uh, Windows Vista or Windows 7 would bring up the start menu, and in this case brings up the start screen. Um, as you can see here, several of these tiles are changing as you watch them. These are known as live tiles, and these are actually accessing current information in the program that they are related to or would launch if clicked. So you can see down here, uh, this is accessing some photos, uh, and if I click that, it would give me my photo uh, program. Uh, right here, kind of down, bottom center, is uh, the finance program, so I'm getting some financial headlines and stock information. Uh, up here, kind of center left, is uh, my weather program uh, from AccuWeather. In this case, I'm not using the default one. I've installed one I think is a little better. So it's showing me the current weather. Above that is current news. Below that is my current calendar. Over here on the left, you'll see people's faces. This is the kind of the IM and people client that is available through here. So a lot of the tiles and a lot of programs that you can get for Windows 8 have these live tile functionality. And the idea is that even on the starting screen, you have the ability to get up-to-date information without necessarily needing to go into the program. Now, if you find the live tiles kind of annoying, um, you can also turn the live functionality of a tile off. And I'll try to get to that a little later. 
Um, you'll see I have a scroll down bar down here at the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and scroll using that scroll bar. Um, I can also, if I have a, a wheel mouse, I can use that. If I have a touch mouse, I can also scroll through that. And you can see here, each of the programs that I've installed, in most cases, has its own start menu item. And I have also organized this start screen kind of into categories. So back on the left, I kind of had that main area. I have my office programs here. I have media programs. I have utilities. Um, I have a whole section on ebook programs, storage, and then kind of have a miscellaneous and a gaming area down all the way to the end here, which I've not actually yet named. Now, rearranging this screen is actually pretty simple. Um, if I want to move this game Untangle over to storage, I can just click and hold on that and then drag it over to where I want it to be and let go. And I have now rearranged that and put it in my little storage area or I can drag and drop and move it back. If I want it kind of up to the beginning, you can see the tiles will move around things. I'll just do one more here. If I want to move Amazon maybe down over here, we can go ahead and do that. <clears throat> one of the kind of semi-hidden things uh, to the start screen is if I click on the bottom right-hand corner here, it kind of zooms out. And now in this case, I can rearrange whole sections of my start menu if I wanted to. So I can say, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and move it around like that, and maybe I'm going to put that ebooks section over here. And then just a mouse click zooms me back in again and allows me to access it. If I zoom out one more time, you'll remember I don't have games labeled here. I can go ahead now and right click on that. And a little toolbar will pop up from the bottom of the screen, and this is something you're going to see over and over again in Windows 8. I can go ahead and click now Name Group. I'm going to call this Games. Go ahead and click Name. So now see it's called games, and if I click and zoom back in again, you'll see that I now have a game group. So this is your start menu, um, or excuse me, your start screen. Even I'm getting used to some of the new terminology. Um, you notice that when I right-clicked when it zoomed out, it gave me that ability to name a group. If I right-click uh, while I'm here, you'll see pretty much no real options, except for all the way to the bottom right-hand corner there, you will see all apps. Now, what is on my start menu does not necessarily have to be everything that I have installed on the computer. When you do install a new program, by default, it does give you um, an icon on the start screen, but you can remove that if you want or rearrange it, as I've already shown. I'm going to go ahead and click on All Apps, and what this is going to do now is it's going to show me in kind of a smaller uh, alphabetical format every single program that I have installed on this computer. Now, it's a pretty new laptop, don't have a lot installed here. It's also a work laptop, so I kind of have just the, the, the things I really need to get the job done installed on here. But in this case, you can see that um, there are more programs that are available to me that are not necessarily on my start screen. And then all I have to do is I can hover over any one of these to click and run it, uh, or I can just press Escape, and that will actually take me back to the last program that I was running, which was PowerPoint in this case. I'm going to go ahead and click my Start menu again, and this will take me into uh, back to my Start window. <clears throat> so let me uh, real quick here go ahead and check uh, the questions, and I'm going to go back to my desktop. And let's see here, excuse me, this is why we usually have two people running this at any one time. Uh, don't see any questions so far, so we'll go ahead and continue. All right. <clears throat> One of the other big changes with Windows 8 besides the start screen, and there is still the desktop, and we'll get back to that in a little bit, is if I take my mouse, in this case, and I kind of move it to either the bottom right or the top right corner, you'll see these charms kind of show up on the side. And then if I just, if I wait too long, they disappear. And then if I just kind of hover up, we get on the right what's called the charms bar, and then in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the date and the time and the fact that I'm connected to a network and the fact that I'm plugged into a, um, a power outlet. There are five charms that are always going to show up in this charms bar. You can also get to this charms bar by t uh, window C on your keyboard, or if you're sw on a touch-enabled screen, you just kind of swipe from the right-hand so side of the screen. Uh, we'll cover each of these in turn. I'm just going to cover one or two of them right now, and we'll kind of get back to others to show you some of the features. But there's search, share, start, devices, and settings. Now, these are all context sensitive. So if I was to click search right now, it would search 
the start screen. If I was to click share, it would probably, in this case, actually tell me there's nothing that I, to share yet. Start will take me to my start screen. So I, in using this the last uh, month or so, have mostly been getting the start screen by pressing on the Windows key on my keyboard. I find that pretty much the easiest, but also you can open up the charms bar and click start. Devices is where you can access hardware that is uh, plugged into your computer. We'll, we'll try to take a look at that a little later. And then also settings. Settings is where I want to take a look for just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and click on settings. And in this case, remember I said it's context sensitive. So we'll come back to settings a little later in other programs. But in this case, since I'm on the start menu, it's I'm now in the start settings. And I can get settings for the tiles or I can get some help. If I go ahead and click tiles, then it basically says, okay, what, what are my options? In this case, only a couple. Show administrative tools, yes or no, and clear personal information from my tiles. So if, say, this is a multi-user computer, you might want to clear out some of that personal information. You can go ahead and go back up. Maybe more importantly is this area down here in the bottom right. Here's where you can always access common Windows-based settings regardless of how what program you are using when you open settings. Okay. So I have network options, I have volume options, screen brightness, notifications, I'll show you some of those notifications later, power, this is where you can reboot the computer, shut down the computer, and uh, basic keyboard information. In this case, you can control uh, which language is being used on your keyboard. So if I was to say just click on the volume here, you can see I get my volume slider that's available to me. Brightness, again, I can change the brightness of my screen. Not sure how well that's coming through. Um, we'll kind of skip some of these others for right now. Change PC settings is kind of the big global settings area uh, that is available. So this actually launches the Windows 8 settings program. Okay, And here you can see down the left-hand side we have several areas. Personalize, users, notifications, search, share, general privacy, etc. Let me talk about a few of these. Right now I'm on personalize and so what I can do here is I can change what's available on the locked screen. Now this is something I can't really show you uh, live through the demo because I'm afraid if I lock my computer I will actually stop sharing the screen and you won't be able to see anything. But if I lock my computer this is the screen that will show up. This is a piece of uh, wallpaper that I chose. I have some other choices available down here and I can also browse for more. And then what I find really cool is I can now also choose what sort of information shows up on that lock screen. So in this case, I have messaging and mail and calendar and uh, the weather showing up. So even if my screen is locked, okay, and this might be a little more useful on a tablet, I will admit, than on a laptop, but if my screen is locked, that information is still being updated live and being shown to me on that lock screen without actually being logged into my computer. Okay. Um, I can also choose some background and color schemes for the start screen. Okay. So instead of those gears, I can change it to something really uh, flowery or a little more uh, uh, underwater spacey sort of thing or uh, these sorts of flowers. I'm going to go back to my gears can also change the color scheme, so I want it a little more pink or a little more gray, green, excuse me, or I'm going to kind of leave it back to, to my blue here. And then I can also control what picture I use to create, uh, uh, to, to represent me. You can upload an image, you can use the built-in camera here as you see right here, um, or you can browse for a photo. Um, users. Users, let me talk about accounts for a few minutes. Um, you can see here it says uh, your account, I'm logged in as me. It's using my personal email address. And it also has the ability to switch to a local account. There are two kinds of accounts available in Windows 8. It's what's known as a local account and a Windows um, Live account. Okay. What I have done is I have created an account with Microsoft and it's like when you create a Google account and you log into Google, I've created a Microsoft account, I log into Microsoft. By having a Microsoft account, there are several benefits over a local account. Benefit number one is you can see here that it says you can switch to a local account, but your, your settings won't sync between the PCs you use. Well, since I'm using a Windows-based account, 
certain settings are now synced between any computer I log in with my Windows account, such as that lock screen settings, um, some photo synchronizations, a few other um, settings that will sync. So what was really kind of cool was I was able to set up this laptop first and got all my account settings set up. And then my home desktop, uh, I got and installed Windows 8 on it and uh, signed in with the same account. And those settings just kind of synced between the two machines. Okay? Personally, I find that really useful. If you have a local account, that will not happen. Okay? You can't log in. You can't sync between local accounts. It's only for that particular computer. Now, the other issue I want to raise is if you want to install applications from the Microsoft Windows Store, which I will show you later in this presentation, then you must have a Microsoft account. Okay? Just like if you have a Google phone and you want to install apps from the Google App Store, you have to have a Google account. Okay? Similar things here. So if you want to be able to install things from the store, you will have to have a Microsoft account. Um, notifications, these are the ability co to control what apps notify you of certain things. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you one example of a notification a little later on. Um, search, this allows you to control what that search button does in the charms. Okay, and, and again, I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, just one or two other screens I want to show you because I don't want to show you, I don't want to spend time showing you all of the settings here. But wireless, here's where you can turn on wireless and wireless sharing. Um, and here are the settings for what you want to sync across computers. And lastly, we have the Windows Update area. And in this case, it will uh, check for updates automatically, install important updates automatically, and notify you of optional updates, and then you can choose to install them. Now, for those of you who are used to running a lot of this stuff out of the control panel in Windows 7, Windows Vista, the control panel still exists. Okay? Everything you can do in Vista on the desktop through some sort of other program is still completely available to you. But what they're trying to do, kind of an underlying philosophy of Windows 8, is to simplify everything, to make the core things that just about everybody does easily accessible. And so right here what they've done is they've said these are the settings that most people use the most often. So we're going to put them in this settings program and give people easy access to them. Um, everything else, if you've said, but what about this setting, but what about that setting, you can still get to it through the control panel, and I will show you that a little later. So I'm going to go ahead and pause here for just a moment. I'm going to go back and uh, see if there are any questions that have come in, and it looks like we've got one or two here, so let me change my screen up so I can read them. Um, the default weather app, uh, Pam is asking, uh, Pamela, excuse me, um, it's, it's just called weather. Uh, it's, it's Microsoft's weather application. Um, I just find it kind of boring uh, in a moment. I'll go, I'll go into the weather app that I installed, and, and I think it's a lot more um, animated and, and gives me a little more detail. Um, but the weather app actually just comes with Windows. Uh, weather Underground, I don't know if they have a Windows 8 application yet, uh, but we can look in the store. Uh, we'll, we'll do that when we get over there. Um, Darmay is asking, is Hotmail a Microsoft account? I do believe so. I believe any Microsoft application that you may have where you have to sign in, uh, that login information should work. So yes, Hotmail would, would work. Uh, I personally don't have a Hotmail address, so I'm not 100% sure, but um, pretty pretty sure on that one. Okay, so uh, let me go back to my start menu, and um, so let me just, I'm going to run the weather app here. Now, um, before I do that, there's another kind of important difference between Windows 8 and what you're used to, and this is where a lot of people kind of complain about how Windows 8 works on a laptop or a desktop computer. It's sort of a hybrid. Don't know how many of you have smartphones, but here's the best analogy I can come up with. If you say you have a, 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 um, a, an Android phone or an iPhone, think about how that works differently than your desktop Windows computer or even your Mac. You run a program, it runs full screen, and you don't run things in Windows. And then when you want to, you go back to the home menu and you can run another program that runs full screen you might be able to also switch between full screen apps, but you're really just running one application at a time. 
that's kind of the central core of Windows 8. The idea of Windows 8 native programs is they run full screen and they run one program at a time, but you can switch between programs if you want to. Now, and that works great in kind of a tablet-based environment. When it comes to a laptop or a desktop computer environment, Windows 8 still has that desktop, the thing we're used to with the windows and the bar across the bottom of the screen that's still available to us. So there's two kinds of programs that you can run in Windows 8. You can run a Windows 8 app or you can run a desktop program. The Most of the programs that you see kind of in this area are apps. Google Chrome is also an app, although you can choose. Thunderbird is my email program. That's a desktop program. So let me uh, run the weather program just to show you what happens. Okay, it's going to kind of load up. It does kind of this animated thing. It's updating its information, and I don't know how well it's coming across here, but we're kind of having a cloudy day, so the clouds are kind of moving across the screen for me. When it's raining, there's actually rain on the screen. When it's snowing, there's snow on the screen. I, I'm, you know, I find it pretty cool. Okay. I can switch between daily and hourly. I can scroll to go into the future, and then I can actually scroll the whole page to see what's available, including an ad over on the right-hand side, so we won't focus on that. And you'll notice in this case, the background is changing as I moved in through the future. Now, I showed you settings before. I'm going to go ahead and go to bottom right, move up here to my charms, and click settings. And now what you see is we still have those kind of computer settings down at the bottom, but if you see up here, we now have the settings for this program. So the idea behind these Windows 8 applications is that you always get to the settings the same way. You open up the charms, and you click settings, and then there are the settings for your application. Okay? No going up to a menu at the top and going, well, is, is preference under edit or file? Okay? So again, different way, but they're trying to consolidate everything to um, move it all together. Okay? Um, I'm going to go back. Now another way to get to the start menu is I can go to the bottom left-hand corner and go, go ahead and click on that start. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, let's talk about the Windows App Store. Basically, if you've been to the iTunes Store or the Google uh, Google Play Store, you understand the concept of a store. So I'm going to go ahead and you notice here it says Store One. Okay. Well, what does that one mean? Okay. Well, let's find out here. Let me go ahead and open the store. And again, it's it's kind of this horizontal scrolling ability to see what's going on here. In this case, if you look in the upper right hand corner here, it says update one. So one of the apps that I have installed has an update. So I'm going to go ahead and click that and it's going to say, hey, one update available for the Nook. All right, so what would I like to do here? Okay, well, I'd like to install it. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. And it's going to say that it's updating and boom, we're done. Nice small update. Funny, I was kind of trying to not run updates for the better part of a week to show you more. Uh, it turned out only one update has come out this week. So, you know, hey, Christmas. Um, and I have this back button here, so that'll take me back to my store. If I want to find a program, okay, now if you remember over in the charms, if I go ahead and type Windows C, there's a search. Okay, let me use, let me use the store to show you how to search. Okay. Now, I want to point out here, here's my search box, okay. Here are some things I've searched for recently, and here it's saying, because this is highlighted, that I'm searching the store because I'm currently in the store. But look at all these other programs that are listed. These are all Windows 8 programs that I've installed that I can search for from here. So just like with settings, they're trying to put the, the settings all in one place, regardless of what program you're running. In this case, it's saying, hey, here is search, and it will search across everything, but by default, it's going to search in the program that you're currently in. All right. So let's say I'm looking for uh, Weather Underground. So I'm going to go ahead and search and it turns out that Weather Underground doesn't have an app available in the App Store. That doesn't mean I can't go to the uh, Weather Underground website and download a program if they have a desktop program. It's just there's not one available through the store. All right. If I just go ahead and try to search for weather you will see here that I now have a whole bunch of different weather programs available for me to install. Okay? Some of them are free, some of them cost money, 
So I'm going to go ahead and quick uh, pick a uh, free, here's the weather channel. We'll just go ahead and show you kind of how this works. Okay. I have an install button. I have an overview. I have details and I have store reviews. And I can scroll up and down here to see a little more information about it. Go ahead and do a quick install. I'm assuming this is not going to take too long to download here. It's going to go ahead and up in the upper right telling me that it's installing. And then here's a notification. It says, hey, the weather channel was installed. At this point, I can run it right from here, and let's go ahead and do that, and load up the weather channel, and it's going to say, hey, do you want it to automatically figure out where you are? I'm going to go ahead and do that. I can also add a location, and yeah, we'll go ahead and do that right now, and here's the weather channel app. Okay. If I go back to my start menu, what this is going to do by default is it's going to add the new tile for the program I just installed at the end of my start screen. You can notice it's also a live tile. If I right click on that tile, again my menu bar at the, at the bottom shows off. I can unpin it from the start screen. I can uninstall it. I can make it a smaller square or I can turn the live tile off. Or I just don't want it there. Press escape. Yeah, I can move it around and say put it over here under miscellaneous. One other thing I'm going to show you real quick uh, while I'm here at the start screen, and then I'll, I'll, I'll check for some more questions, is on the start screen, you can always still start typing. So you might be wondering, hey, where is the control panel? I don't see an icon for the control panel. Well, I'm just here on the start screen. I'm going to start typing. Okay. And again, it automatically starts a search for me. You can see here I have control panel. It also brought up default programs. It found two apps for me. 15 different settings that mention the word control, and 46 files that mention the word control. And then I can also search these other programs if I want. And if I want to see my control panel, I can just go ahead and do that. And that brings me up. So where I've gotten now, and if I close this, excuse me, let's save that. I am now on my desktop. Okay, We still have the desktop. We still have the control panel, as I mentioned. I have my clock down here in the bottom right. I have my volume. I have all of my um, uh, uh, system tray icons. I have my running programs that I can pin to the taskbar down at the bottom. Just the biggest difference here is there is no start button in the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Okay. So it is kind of a hybrid environment. I want to stress that. It, it, it is kind of an interesting experience. I have my desktop, but I still have my charms. Okay. And if I go into settings now, I now have desktop options for my settings, such as general information about the PC. I can personalize it. I can go to the control panel. Okay. If I close my control panel, I can still right-click on the desktop, and I still have my view and my sort and um, uh, my you know new folders, new shortcuts, change my screen resolution, personalize it. All of those options are still available. They're just on this thing called the desktop. Okay. <clears throat> okay, uh, so Pamela is asking a really great question. How long did it take you to become comfortable with the Windows 8? Um, well, thank you for thinking I'm completely comfortable with it. I want to I want to start with that because um, this is the first time I've actually um, presented it to other people. So if I'm coming across as comfortable, uh, I I guess I'm doing my job. So thank you very much for that. Um, let me uh, let's see. Okay, before uh, to, to um, uh, NLA before conference this last fall. I had a touchscreen desktop computer running Windows 8 on my desk for about three weeks. Uh, so at that point, I got to really kind of, I, I wanted to get used to it intentionally um, with kind of the touchscreen. So I almost tried not to use the mouse as much as possible. I used the touchscreen as much as I could. Um, I then got this laptop about a month ago maybe a little less, and immediately installed Windows 8 on it. And I also got uh, my new desktop computer also about a month ago and installed Windows 8 on it. So kind of maybe ignoring those two or three weeks in advance, uh, I would say about a month of just using it. Now, I still have um, my main computer in my office that's running uh, Windows Vista. Um, 
All the other computers in my house are still running Windows 7. So I, I'm kind of in that like hybrid environment. I've even got computers running Linux. Um, so, but I, I got comfortable pretty quick. I would say within about a week or two, I was able to do what I needed to do. Now, I still have to sometimes look things up. I still have to say, hey, where did they hide that? But that's kind of the minimum. Uh, so, you know, kind of about a month, I would say. Um, other questions. Uh, is, do you think it's more dependable than 7 Vista or XP? Oh, boy. Um, I'm going to say yes, but don't make me defend that all that much because I'm maybe not sure what you mean by dependable. Um, it's faster. Um, I haven't had a crash yet. Um, it boots really, really fast. Uh, so there are some definite benefits to it. Uh, if you want to, Ron, maybe explain dependable a little more, um, you, you might want to do that. Um, is touchscreen important to this? Pamela is asking. Um, I would say yes, but not necessary. Okay. Um, in other words, what, when, what Microsoft is trying to do is trying to create one operating system that works with a mouse, with a keyboard, and with touch. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to use Vista or 7 on a touchscreen device, but it's awkward. It's not designed for it. This is designed for it. Um, I, I even have a, I'll, I'll try to put a link to it in uh, the show notes when we publish this, but uh, I do have a, a chart that says, okay, this is what you want to do. Here's how you do it on the keyboard. Here's how you do it on the mouse. Here's how you do it on the touch screen. Everything you can do, you can do on all three platforms. So um, it, it's designed for that, but not required. On my home computer, I got what's called a touch mouse. It's excuse me. It's shaped just like a mouse, but where you put your your for your two fingertips to to click is actually touch. So I can actually do some on-screen simulation of touch on my mouse. So I have the way of kind of changing what program I'm accessing, which on a touch screen, you would kind of touch the screen and swipe left or right. I can actually do that on my mouse. You can actually get swipe-enabled uh, touch pads. So if you really want to take advantage of the touching interface without having a, a touch screen device, there are peripherals you can do that with. Okay, and so those are pretty cool. On this laptop, I've got a regular touchpad, which doesn't have the swiping, and a regular wheel mouse. And um, I, like I said, as you can see, I, I've gotten used to it pretty quickly. Um, have you heard about using the Start button and X to bring up the control panel and other common commands while on the Start uh, screen? Karen is asking. Oh, yeah, there shortcuts. So let me see if I can. Um, I'm going to go back to the Start screen, and I think it's uh, Win X. Okay. This also you can get in the bottom by clicking in the bottom left hand corner. This so uh, to to repeat, you can click in the bottom left hand corner. Excuse me, right click in the bottom left hand corner, or do Windows X, and this brings up some administrative features. There's your task manager, your control panel, the file explorer, things like that. And again, file explorer still exists, but I'm going to show you the new one in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to go back to my desktop. I know we have some other questions. Pamela is asking, no problem downloading over Windows 7. Uh, no, I actually did the um, downloadable online install both on this laptop and my home desktop. Uh, now, yes, I was upgrading these machines, but they were brand new machines. I have not done an upgrade to Windows 8 on a machine that has been running Vista or 7 for you know a couple of years. Uh, but the experience should be the same. I had absolutely no problems uh, during the install process. I, I did have some problems with the purchasing process, but that's a separate issue. Um, I went to the Windows site. I said I want to, you know, I downloaded a little program. It said, hey, these programs are going to work. These programs are going to have to be installed. It's called the Upgrade Assistant. Uh, did the download, did the install, rebooted, and I had Windows 8. And the whole thing took maybe half an hour um, now. So basically, it's going to depend on your, your bandwidth. Uh, but uh, I have done the online install in both cases and uh, worked beautifully. Uh, Ron is um, saying uh, dependable equals no crashes, moves quickly, or easy to use. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I have had absolutely no crashes on either machine in uh, the month or so that I've been using them. So zero there. Uh, moves quickly. Uh, I am getting excellent response rates, moving really, really well. Though I will stress, 
These are brand new machines. Uh, the laptop is an Ultrabook with, a, with an SSD hard drive in it, so um, that's going to move fast no matter what you put on it. Um, the new desktop PC I got has like 12 megs of RAM and is a 3 point something gigahertz. So I am running this equipment on some, or excuse me, Windows 8 on some pretty heavy equipment. The um, touchscreen device that I ran it on was uh, an older HP that was running Windows 7 and not super duper under the hood and worked great. So um, basically my understanding is if the hardware can run Vista, or 7, you can run Windows 8 and you should actually get noticeable improvements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Darme is asking, what about old PCs running XP? Would they be able to handle Windows 8? I don't know about XP. Uh, and as you can hear from my voice, uh, there's, there's some hesitation in there. Um, what any of you want to do, if you're thinking of running uh, an existing computer and installing Windows 8, you get a program called the uh, Windows 8 Upgrade Assistant. And what that will do is that will scan your hardware, scan your software, and give you a report back that says, this software will work, this software will not work, this software you'll have to reinstall because it won't survive the upgrade, and then whether or not the hardware can actually handle the upgrade. Um, so... You know, when you say old PC running XP, uh, A, will is there an upgrade path? I'm not clear you can actually update from or upgrade from Windows XP. You may have to do a clean install. Uh, and then if you do a clean install, it's ultimately going to depend on what sort of hardware is under the hood. Okay? Like I said, I'm 99.9% uh, .9 sure anything running Vista or 7 will run Windows 8 no problem. XP going to be a little more iffy. So check that Windows 8 update assistant or upgrade assistant. Okay, um, so uh, keep sending in the questions. I will come back um, and uh, uh, check with some questions uh, more. And thank you for having questions because I really want to answer what you want to know. All right, um, let me show you a few more things. I'm going to go back to the start menu here. And I'm going to go ahead and plug in an SD card. Uh, if nothing else, I would have plugged in a flash drive, but I'm using all three USB ports on this computer right now. And I'm going to show you what happens here. And so just plug that in. Okay, it does the little note. And then here's one of those notifications in the upper right. Okay, it says, hey, you've, you've uh, plugged in an SD card. What do you want to do when you plug in uh, memory cards? Because I haven't done it before. So uh, this little window opens up. And again, very simplified. If you're familiar with, with Vista or 7, you'll know that, hey, you've plugged something in. Here's the 17 things you can do with it. Or do you want to set the default or whatever? And basically, it's just saying, hey, you've done this for the first time. What do you want to do with memory cards? Do you want to import the photos and videos into the photo program? Do you want to view them? Uh, do you want to, uh, in this case, since I have Dropbox installed, it knows that I have uh, VLC installed. Or I can just do nothing or I can open uh, the folder to view the files in File Explorer. File Explorer is Windows Explorer. I'm just going to go ahead and do that, and you'll see we have over here, this is, we're back to the desktop, and uh, we can just browse those folders and files as anybody else would, as you're used to. Um, Ron, I'm just noticing your last question was easy to use. Uh, you said no crashes moves quickly uh, or easy to use. Um, I'm going to leave the easy to use up to you. I think it's easy to use. Um, however, I've not yet installed this on my wife's computer at home. Uh, it is different. Um, I personally tend to force myself to adapt because part of my job is adapting quickly so I can help others. Other people may look at this and go, this is insane, this is ridiculous, and um, trust me, those reviews are out there. So. Um, I, I'm going to say I think it's easy to use, but um, it is different. There is a learning curve. Okay, um, so let's see here. We have about 15 more minutes. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my start menu. And let me just show you a few other things real quick that are kind of built in uh, and available on Windows. I already kind of showed you the uh, weather program. Um, the calendar program I think is really, really nice. Again, very simplified. In this case, I have hooked it up to uh, my Google Calendar, so it's automatically syncing all that information. If I go ahead and bring up that uh, uh, settings term, okay, I can just go into accounts, and you can see here I've hooked it up to my Windows Calendar, which I don't really use, and my Google Calendar, 
You can go ahead and add an account and it will pull that information in real quick. Okay. Go back to start. Um, the messaging program. Um, I like the messaging program, but um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it, um, it, it, it's, it, it's simplified, but it doesn't integrate very well with lots of things at the moment. At the moment, it only works with Facebook messaging and the Microsoft messaging. Uh, it doesn't do Google Chat. It doesn't do AOL Instant Messenger. It doesn't do uh, some of the other IM programs that are out there. Uh, but it does work pretty well for what it does. So like we said here, kind of that simplified interface. Um, the People app, this is basically your online address book, which I find pretty cool. It will pull in information. If you look in the upper right here, it's got my Microsoft contacts, my Facebook contacts, my Twitter contacts, my LinkedIn contacts, and I think if I pull in more, as my Google contacts. Um, so you can pull in uh, all of your contacts from, from lots of different sources into this. Um, it also has this what's new, and again, because I've linked it to things like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, this is kind of a client that will pull in and show you different information of the people you're following from those different applications. So what Microsoft is trying to do with a lot of these things is pull it all into one place, pull it all into one particular program. Go ahead and go back to my start menu. Now, something I haven't showed you is actually switching between running programs. And again, that is, uh, there are several ways to do it. Um, I'm an old school keyboard junkie. I like my alt tab. So if I go into alt tab here and keep tabbing, you can see I can run through the running programs and switch between what's going on here. So if I want to switch back to the store, I can just go ahead and switch back to the store. Um, I can also use my mouse or my keyboard to pull up kind of the Windows 8 method of switching, which in this case is if I go to the bottom, excuse me, uh, left of the screen, if you can see all the way to the left-hand side of the screen there, there's kind of little lines showed up. I don't want to point to them because the moment I point to them, they'll, they'll do something. But I'm just going to take my, I've moved my mouse pointer all the way to the bottom left, and now I'm just going to kind of run it up the left side of the screen and you can see here, here are the running programs. If you were using a touch screen device, you would just swipe in from the left hand side of the screen with a finger and this would show up. And so from here I can switch back to my calendar. If I do this with the keyboard, I can do Windows tab and tab through. So instead of Alt tab, I can do Windows tab and bring that up. If I bring that up again, I can right click on things and I can close them. Okay. And what's kind of a little more cool, and this is something I have not really played with all that much and I think works a little better on a touchscreen device. If I right click on this, notice there is snap left and snap right. I'm going to go ahead and I'm looking at my weather program, but I'm going to take the people program and tell it to snap left. And what that's going to do here is it's going to give me a split screen. And as you can see here, I can actually kind of change it so that that one's bigger and the other one's smaller. So the idea here is that I can, instead of running things at full screen, I can actually run two programs at once and still have the ability to do all those other things. And let's see if I'm messaging snap right. Okay, now I've got my messaging program running down the right-hand side of the screen, or I can snap it to the left-hand side of the screen. Okay? So if you have kind of a program you're working in, but you want to keep uh, another program with constantly updating uh, information off to the side, you can do that. Now I will say, um, and you, you might have been able to figure this one out, this is really designed for a widescreen device, so if you've still got a square monitor, this, this might not work nearly as well. Okay. So I'm going to go here and switch to my desktop, okay. and you can see here that I'm now running my desktop, but I still have that messaging program going on over on the right-hand side, so if someone wants to chat with me, I can run things on my desktop here, and I can still have the chat window open on the right hand side. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, looking here, not seeing any other questions. Pamela saying too bad about chat. Yeah, I'm really hoping that Microsoft will will add additional uh, chat features to this. Um, they've definitely integrated Facebook pretty uh, solidly and um, they obviously want you to use uh, their chat program also. So I'm kind of crossing my fingers on that one. I'd really love to see Google Chat uh, worked into this. All right, let me show you another feature that's kind of cool that's kind of built into Windows 8 here, and that's one of those charms called Share.
Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up the NBC News program. I'm also going to close this out so it takes up the full screen here again. And so this is a program I've installed from the App Store. And you can see here I can scroll through. And the, um, the, uh, the interface of these new programs I really like. Okay. So we've got this article here, First Lady Gives Kids a Special Thrill for Christmas. If I open that up, it actually, and, and a lot of these programs do this, it's this full screen immersive environment uh, that I can now scroll through here and it's really easy to read. It's, it's, it's web-like, but it's not really a web page and you can go on to the next article. In this case, we've got an embedded video. You can kind of page through it with your scrolling. I, I, I'm just really impressed by this style of uh, application. But let's say I wanted to share this. Now, I've already told Windows about my LinkedIn account and my Facebook account and my Google email accounts and things like that. So because it knows about that, if I click on the share charm, <clears throat> it's going to give me the ability and uh, to share this out via email, in this case via Evernote, or to people because you know maybe I want to send it to somebody in particular. So if I go ahead and click on people, it's going to load up the pro people program, and it's going to say, okay, do you want to share it on Facebook or on Twitter? Well, okay, I'm going to share that on Facebook. So I can type in my own message from Windows 8 as a demo. Um, I can change which picture is being used, send without an image. I uh, can't change the text here. It's kind of built in. And I just go ahead and click send, and it sends it, and off it goes. So I didn't have to copy a link, I didn't have to switch over to Facebook, I just sent it right from this application and it knew right where to send it for me. Okay. So I think that's pretty cool. I have not really taken advantage of it all that much yet. Um, I've been kind of focusing on a lot of other features to Windows 8, but I, th I think that one's pretty cool. Um, let me go ahead and check questions real quick here. Uh, Pamela says, sweet. Yeah, I, I do like that that sharing sort of interface there. All right, let me go back to start and show you one or two more things. Um, kind of as a side note, um, Office 2013 is available in a, de in a beta mode right now. Uh, it's not officially out, and um, it is not an actual Windows app. It's actually a desktop app, but it looks like Windows 8. So let me just give you a quick look at, say, what the new Word looks like. This is what we coming. And so what we've got here is the Word 2013 preview. Open it up. We have the, the, the recent documents that I've worked on here. We have different kinds of documents that I might want to actually create in here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up uh, this, uh, uh, let's see, what do I want to open up here? Uh, Ebooks training document. And so you kind of, you, you're on the desktop. This is a desktop application. I can go ahead and, and change this down into a smaller window or I can open it back up to the full screen. It has the, the, um, the uh, uh, a ribbon across the top, but you kind of get that Windows 8 feel to it. Um, they're kind of hoping that when it comes out, it will actually be along the lines of uh, an actual Windows 8 app, but at the moment it is still a desktop app with that Windows 8 feel. So this is kind of where that sort of hybridization between the desktop and the Windows 8 sort of interfaces uh, starts to kind of um, uh, bump into each other just a little bit. Okay. Last thing I want to show you, and if you've got more questions, please, please do that, um, is another one of these aspects of the hybrid between the two. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and show you Internet Explorer. So I don't have an icon for it. So this is going to be Internet Explorer 10 in, oh, Windows mode. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this is where things get really, really interesting. Okay. And probably a better way to show you this is I'm actually going to launch Chrome because Chrome is my default browser. Browsers is this weird area in Windows 8 at the moment. Okay. So let me launch Windows 8. And as you can see here, Windows 8 is running full screen as if it is a Windows 8 application. Okay? It's not running on the desktop. 
you can install multiple browsers in Windows 8. So I actually have Internet Explorer, which came with it, Firefox, and Chrome. But only the default browser can run in the Windows 8 full screen mode. So notice when I launched Windows, or excuse me, Internet Explorer, it came up as a window on the desktop. But when I launched Chrome, it came up as a full screen application. But in these cases with browsers, you can actually switch between the two. So in Chrome, if I actually go here to its settings menu built in, okay, and change it to relaunch Chrome on the desktop, what that's going to do is it's going to exit the Windows 8 mode, and it's going to relaunch it as a regular old window on the desktop like you would be used to. And now we can maximize it, and we can make it smaller, and rearrange it however we want. If I want to put it back, I just can choose relaunch Chrome in Windows 8 mode. And you'll see there, after a couple of seconds. So, Ron, you were wondering if I could crash this thing? <laughs> I might just have. Okay, I have not crashed Windows, but I seem to have crashed Chrome. So, there you go. It's not perfect. So, what I'm going to do here is I just to close Chrome, okay, and then let's see if I can run it again. There we go, and it didn't close correctly, so please restore all my tabs. Okay. Um, Internet Explorer, let me show you this real quick, is really different. If you're concerned about a learning curve, if you're used to Chrome and you just looked at Chrome, even in the full screen mode, it still works like Chrome. If I set this as my default browser, and so it says, okay, what do you want it to be? I want it to be Internet Explorer. And when Internet Explorer launches in full screen mode, it's, it's different. I mean, you've got no menus at the top. You have got uh, no address bar at the top, nothing. It is in full screen mode. Here's my scrolling. Okay. How do I get to an address bar? Right click. Okay. And when you right click, if there's not a menu, the menu will show up. And in this case, now here's my address bar. Here is, I can pin this site to the start menu. I can go to another website, such as um, libraries.ne.gov. And there is that full screen again. Okay. Over on the left, this is my back button. And then over on the right will be my forward button. Okay. This thing is different. So if you are an Internet Explorer user and you want to keep using Internet Explorer, which I'm not saying do or don't, I'm just, I'm not an IE user. Um, IE 10 in Windows 8 is very different. So this might be the single biggest hurdle you have to get over. All right, so um, Firefox, uh, Pat was asking, um, yes, you uh, can uh, install Firefox launch that here and again it is not my defaults no um, so it does run in a Windows mode it is completely available completely compatible uh, will do everything that uh, Firefox does on your existing machines so uh, that also works um, so we are coming up on 11 o'clock uh, that is a very fast tour of Windows 8 and kind of hitting the highlights as to uh, what is out there uh, that is available. So um, my I, my defaults are all screwed up now. Oh yeah, IE is my default, so uh, we're now back to running Chrome in a window on the desktop. Uh, so are there any other questions or comments about Windows 8 that you may have? I'm, I'm glad you all had so many. It was uh, I was really hoping you would have some questions that I, that I could answer for you. Okay. Um, if any other questions come in, as I, I, I'll kind of wrap it up. I will happily stay on the line to, to answer those. Uh, but uh, seeing no other questions coming in at the moment, I do want to thank everybody for, for taking this hour to uh, spend some time with us here. And um, yes, uh, Darmay, it is cold here. It's right about, you know, single digits still at the moment. Six degrees, according to the clock across the street. Um, so thank you all for attending. Uh, I want to remind you that we do have some upcoming episodes. 
uh, of Encompass Live, and this is not the screen I wanted to be on, so excuse me, there we go. Uh, next week, Chris and I will be on the line to talk about 23 Things the Next Generation. Uh, that'll be on January 2nd. On January 9th, we have a show, Internships, Cultivating Nebraska's Future Librarians. And then on January 16th, Day in the Life of the Scholarship Student Conference Attendees. So it sounds like we got some very interesting sessions coming up. Don't know what my tech talk will be in January quite yet. Got some ideas, but I uh, need to get some people uh, back from uh, the holidays before I can get them scheduled. Crystal will also, I'm sure, appreciate me uh, reminding you that we do have an Encompass Live Facebook page that uh, you're welcome to like us on and follow along. We post uh, upcoming shows there and when the recordings come out and things like that. Uh, so um, if you're a Facebook user, go ahead and like us and follow us there. So uh, with that, don't see any other questions. Thank you all for attending. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. And thank you very much. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to you know drop me a line. And we'll get this recording up in a day or two. And um, good luck with Windows 8. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.